Quantum physics is no simple subject to explain or attempt to even comprehend. And quantum computers are no different. Nevertheless, this is here by popular demand. Here is how a quantum computer works. Trusty Whiteboard here, and now in order to explain quantum computers, how they work on a basic level, or as basic as I can possibly make it, we have to understand how the classical computing system works based on a binary code using just ones and zeros. Now imagine a transistor like a switch. I kind of ran through this in this video here, but I'll go over it again just for those who haven't watched that video yet. Uh, so transistors are essentially switches. This is the open state, we'll denote that as zero, and this is the closed state, we'll denote that as one. In this state here, current is allowed to flow, and in this state here, current can not. So binary transistors open and close to indicate one and zero. And if the threshold voltage is not reached, a gap in the current is created indicating a zero for false. Whether it's a one or zero really depends on the algorithm being used. They'll always be opposites. So for our examples in this video, one will equal true, which equals a closed circuit, and zero equals false, which equals an open circuit. This is how all data in modern computing systems is transmitted and processed. And you can imagine how multiple switches, multiple transistors, billions of them actually actually in a single processor, opening and closing billions of times a second can equate to some serious computational power. But quantum computers make PCs like this one behind me seem like basic calculators. They aren't binary systems per se, although we often use one and zero to denote the range of values quantum bits or qubits can denote. The word quantum in phrases like quantum mechanics and quantum physics, which inherently makes them sound very daunting, literally just describes the energy states of very small particles. And the reason why we've only started using this word in the past I don't know, half a century or so is because we never had tools small enough and precise enough to measure the energy states of things like electrons, photons, and even just whole atoms. But thanks to research done by folks like Werner Heisenberg, Serge Haroche, and David Weinland, we now know that it also describes how an electron can be in two places at once. This is from where quantum computing is derived. Instead of ones and zeros, regular bits, qubits can represent an infinite range of values between one and zero. Think of them like probabilities. And unlike the classical counterpart, Part, qubits can be physical objects like electrons and photons. Imagine a compass with one pole denoted one and the other pole denoted zero. The needle of a compass can swing whenever it wants, wherever it wants within the system, but it can never point to anything higher than one or lower than zero. Instead, it can point to areas in between the two poles and represent the likelihood of either becoming a one or zero once the qubit is processed and observed. This area in between is what's known as superposition. When we read and interpret classical, let's say, three binary data streams, we understand that eight outcomes are possible. Since there are only two possible states and three bits, two raised to n, where n is three, equals eight. So eight possible outcomes here in all probabilities of which must equal one. So there's a 100% chance that a three-bit binary system will yield one of these values, since they're the only values possible with three digits and two numbers. A quantum three-bit system works a bit different, however. Since each qubit can denote any complex number between zero and one, then the sum of the squares of each complex probability must equal one for a 100% probability. When we make a measurement of a three-bit quantum system, the values of the particles in each orientation collapse to a classical state of binary. But the computational power of a three-bit quantum computer far exceeds that of classical systems. Where binary systems require two raised to the power n bits, quantum computers can express the same amount of information in just n qubits. For scale, just a 30-qubit quantum computer would be capable of nearly 10 teraflops of floating operations per second, a process which in today's modern technology would require billions of trans transistors. That's pretty awesome, but don't get too excited because the modern applications of quantum computers are still yet to be seen in a sense. We use them a lot for like predictions and probabilities because they can do multiple operations super fast. Parallelism in quantum computers is insane. But to watch Netflix or watch YouTube or even, I don't know, render a video, quantum computers aren't all that viable yet. Simply put, modern processors already do a pretty darn good job at those simple tasks on PCs, so it wouldn't make much sense to replace them, which can be anywhere from like 50 bucks to maybe 500 bucks with super expensive multi-million dollar quantum PCs. They, they don't belong in your living room, they belong in research laboratories. QCs also get extremely hot and have to be cryogenically cooled down to roughly zero Kelvin in most cases. They must also be shielded from the outside world since even the smallest magnetic disturbances can offset a qubit's reading and promote decoherence. That's the word you don't want to hear if you're in the QC business. They're also extremely large, expensive, and difficult to maintain. The viability of quantum quantum computers
parameters might change as our infrastructure and technology does, but I still expect we'll be using binary systems for quite some time. They just work. We don't have to worry about things like quantum decoherence, insane shielding, or overheating. Well, okay, maybe a little overheating, but not on the same scale. But much like early binary computers, quantum computers today are very large. Who knows? In, say, the next 50 years, we may shrink quantum processors, or what might become quantum processors, down to the size of a modern transistor processor. There are about 2 billion transistors in the space, a space really no larger than the surface area of my thumbnail. But imagine 2 billion qubits in the same space. That is insane computational power. That's aliens, man. I am worried though, by about that time, I expect we'll have discovered a true artificial intelligence, which will mean the end of ourselves, basically terminators roaming everywhere. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, thumbs down for the opposite, click that red subscribe button if you haven't already, and click that bell notification icon, by the way, so you get notified when more videos like these go live. This is Science Studio, thanks for learning with us.